Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You're all very welcome. Uh, it's good to see you all here. Uh, great crowd. Uh, I'm Jim Livingstone. I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, uh, recently retired civil servant. I was director of safety and quality and standards in Northern Ireland. And uh, being retired, it means I'm now free to say what I really want to say about, <laughs> about what goes on in healthcare. <coughs> Although I'm, I'm, I'm still depending on my pension, so I have to be very careful that I don't go too far. But um, uh, this is, I think, an interesting session, engaging physicians, uh, and I have to say in my role as a civil servant, the en engagement between myself and doctors wasn't always the smoothest of operations, uh, but uh, it's, it's such an important aspect of patient uh, our safety, safety improvement that we get that sort of engagement, we get that sort of uh, uh, passion and commitment, perhaps, that's needed to actually affect real change. We have two great speakers, uh, all the way from New Zealand and Australia. John Cullen, uh, who's uh, uh, head of elective, elective surgery centre in, in uh, New Zealand, and Johnny Tates, Sydney's Children's Hospital Network. Johnny's originally from South Africa, and you're both very welcome, gentlemen. And uh, very different talks, very different presentations, but taken together, I think, uh, you know, I think we're getting two very important perspectives on uh, engaging uh, physicians in safety improvement. So, Johnny, could I, or John, uh, if I could ask you to start off? Okay, thank you very much. Everyone. By the way. Uh, Please feel free to Twitter. There's, uh, you know, uh, if you've been here yesterday, you'll know you can tweet away. We've got two folks here who are going to be monitoring tweets. Any questions, please just send them through. Uh, we'll take questions at the end of each speaker, and then we'll have a little session wrap up at the end where we can sort of take uh, questions to both speakers. Okay? Thank you very much, John. Good morning, everybody. And good morning to my uh, New Zealand colleagues. My name is John Cullen and I come from Auckland, New Zealand. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about engaging clinicians in change. Now before I move on to the talk, there are one or two things I just wanted to tell you about New Zealand healthcare. New Zealand has a population of four and a half million and our spending per capita on health in New Zealand puts us firmly in the middle of the OECD countries. And for most health outcomes we remain either just above or just below medium. There is however one measurement that I'm a little bit ashamed about and that is that I now find out that we are the third most obese country in the world. Auckland has a population of 1.2 million and the hospital that I work for as an orthopaedic surgeon is one of three district health boards. It's called Waitamata District Health Board but we will refer to that as we go along as the WDHB. I might add, of course, that I am an orthopaedic surgeon and have been for some time. This meeting is concerned with the three topics of quality, saving lives and reducing costs. And this talk in particular is related to engaging senior clinicians, surgeons and anaesthetists to reduce the cost of surgery. Now if I'm going to have a solution to something, we need to know what the problem is, so the next few slides relate to the problem that we're going to address. And the first two slides are from the New Zealand Treasury. This slide is a cost-adjusted slide for the costs and spending in health in New Zealand since 1950. That is the red line at the top. The blue line relates to the increase in the country's GDP. This says it all for me. It's the reason why I'm here and it's the reason what I've been trying to do. Is that our health costs, and I don't think this is unique to New Zealand, is far outstripping our ability to pay. If we don't do something about this, then in 15 years time, New Zealand will have no money left to pay for roads or education. It will all go on health. 
So we need to introduce systems which will bring about change and reduce costs. The second slide is an interesting slide to me because this relates to doctor and nurse productivity within our public hospitals. The top line relates to the increase in the number of doctors and nurses that are employed in the public hospitals. The second line down relates to the increase in productivity. That's fine. But the bottom line actually relates and measures productivity related to each individual or each full-time equivalent employee. So we're actually employing more people, but we're actually using them less efficiently. Now in New Zealand, we have a public and private system, but the private system relates particularly to the provision of elective surgery. And in our country, surgeons and anaesthetists work in both private and public hospitals. Some entirely one or entirely the other, but the majority work in both. And this immediately produces some conflict of interest. In private, very generally, which is a fee-for-service model, this promotes productivity, but it certainly doesn't promote efficiency. And unfortunately, in the public hospital, where the senior staff are employed on a time-based or salary system, this promotes neither productivity nor efficiency. Now, there are one or two problems additional to the overall problem that I've just presented. And for WDHB or Wanamata, population growth required a new ward every three years. And it was our calculations a few years ago that if nothing was done, we would have no beds for elective surgery by the year 2013. This has been mitigated over the last year or two by some increase in beds, but the problem still remains. In addition, additional operating rooms were required to repatriate services from other areas in the city, and we required room to decant operating to other operating theatres to allow refurbishing of the now outdated theatres in one of the hospitals. In addition, it is one of our government's six health targets to increase the elective surgery provided to our population. So to address the problem and to see what we could do to address these problems which I've just outlined, I had the opportunity to visit six treatment centres in the UK and in addition to that, one or two centres which have a reputation for high efficiency and productivity, such as the Norfolk Norwich Hospital. We also, between us, reviewed 132 papers on the subject, and we came to the conclusion that this was a universal problem and that there was no single solution. So we requested to the Ministry of Health and the Treasury if they would fund a new facility because we needed that, but in return for that we would promise to address the existing problems of both productivity and efficiency in elective surgery. The Ministry's response was, well that's fine, but you have an unused operating theatre which is used as a storeroom in a small hospital 35 kilometres away from where you are, so why don't you use that as a trial for these ideas that you have. It wasn't quite what I expected, but that's what we they were therefore elected to do. The Ministry and the Hospital Board also encouraged us to review and question current practice. That's easy to do. The answers are a little bit more difficult. Why is productivity and efficiency in the operating room so difficult to manage? What is it about the interface between managers, surgeons and anaesthetists that makes it such a difficult project? I know it occurs in many hospitals around the world where, the, where things are efficient, but in our country it is something that is very difficult for an outside person to manage for us. Why are there variations in productivity in different hospitals? 
Why is there a difference in productivity in New Zealand between the private and public hospitals? And another question. Why does the department that I work in, which serves a population of 550,000 people, it runs a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week service, but do we actually need 39 doctors to run that service? And in part, answer to that question is that we are staffed on a traditional basis, which has been accepted and it can't be changed, but in fact, in our service, and I think in many other services, we have too many doctors. Why can't consumable costs be reduced? So we came up with a possible solution, and that was to create an environment so clinicians themselves would drive both productivity and efficiency. And therefore, a new employment contract was developed to facilitate this. Now this is called an alliance contract, and I have here a photo of the Auckland Harbour Bridge. And that's relevant because alliance contracting as a concept is very common in big government projects where you may be building a bridge or a tunnel. And in effect, it is a system which is developed so that the funder and the contractors work together to work efficiently. So it's a type of collaborative contract that relies, and I emphasise, a trusting relationship between those contract partners. And the purpose is to align commercial incentives so that funder and supplier are working towards a common goal. Now, an important part of an alliance contract is that the funder and the contractors have to agree to an initial price. And in New Zealand, the concept of an alliance contract is facilitated by two things. One is that we have defined surgical volumes to achieve over each year. And for Whiter Matter, or WDHB, we are contracted to provide 15,853 operations, which means whatever contracting system you have, you cannot over-service. And there's also a defined national price for each procedure. For example, a total knee replacement, note this please those from the United States, can be done for 14,154 American dollars, and that includes the cost of the implant. So we cannot overcharge, we have to work within those parameters. So the pilot was established, and it's initially established to involve both total hip and total knee replacement surgery. And this was done at that peripheral hospital called Waitakere. It was involved with two orthopaedic surgeons and two anaesthetists, the four of whom had a desire to make a difference. The principles that we established were as follows. It was important that we had surgeon, and anaesthetic and nursing teams. And this team structure developed to be a very strong team structure to the extent that the picture here is actually of the anaesthetist cleaning the floor between operations to ensure that the operations and the handover was as quick, quick as possible. The surgeon and anaesthetist were involved in training the nursing staff for this new project. And we were quite firm that we would establish patient cohorts that is, the same type of operation would be done in the operating theatre on the same day. Now, there are many examples of this, this whether it be in Toronto or Belfast, but I think there's little doubt that where you can cohort similar surgical procedures, your efficiencies and productivity increases. The hospital we had to work in had no junior staff, so the concept was built round no junior staff. So senior doctors were then employed on and paid on outputs. They were paid for what they did. But in addition to this, they had to look after the patient throughout their stay in hospital. And that became the package of care concept. 
There is also an empowerment of the senior clinicians to actually run the service as they thought most appropriate. <coughs> so what we then did was to analyse the data that then became available from the pilot and compared it with a similar cohort of patients in the main base hospital. This was carried out between 1st of July 2010 and 31st of March 2011, and it involved 335 patients. The cohorts were very similar, and you can see that the age for hips and knees was similar between the pilot and the base hospital. And in addition, the anaesthetic grading and complexity of the surgery was also very similar. So we're very confident that we had two very similar groups to compare. So some of the results were as follows. For hip replacements, the time in theatre reduced from 166 minutes to 104. For knee replacements, it reduced from 176 minutes to 113 minutes, which meant the productivity from the operating room went from in the standard hospital, 2.3 operations per day, and I agree that's not very good, up to four, and the surgeons are now looking at a regular five, operating, uh, five total joint operating day. In addition, the length of stay went down, and that was from 5.2 days for hips to 3.3, and a similar reduction for knees. But the important part was the cost and revenue differences. And on this slide, on the left-hand side, we'll see the different modalities that were measured. Surgeon time, anaesthetic time, anaesthetic pre-admission, theatre costs, implant costs, and you note that they're the same right the way through, ward costs and other miscellaneous costs. And I think the best thing is that in summary, the costs were significantly reduced because of this increase in productivity. So for example, hip replacements, the total cost went down from 12,800 to 11,400. So the results here show that the, in the pilot, there was a 17% lower cost for the surgery in knee replacements than in the main hospital, and for hips this difference was 12%. Now you equate that over, a thousand joints, which is what we are expected to do in our hospital per year, that equates to $1.66 million. There are a few additional gains in here that we hadn't quite anticipated, and one was a change of practice. Now, this pilot has actually expanded, expanded quite considerably, and one of the shoulder surgeons came to us and said he would like to be part of the project. So it's fine. So Peter, what is it that you can do for us that's actually going to help improve productivity and efficiency? And he said, well, I'm a shoulder surgeon, and if I actually change the way I do the surgery, I can do six a day instead of three. So, well, that's fine, but why don't you do it in any way? And, and he says, well, I'm a shoulder surgeon, and they expect me to do it with the arthroscope. But if I do a mini open operation, I can significantly increase productivity. What's more, if you buy an instrument for us, I can reduce the cost of consumables from $2,000 per operation down to 600 Now the thing is that if as a manager you went to that surgeon and said, I want you to do this and this, he would say, no, I'm the boss. I'll do it the way I think is appropriate. But allowing them to run the service and to decide and work under this alliance contract model uh, meant that they themselves initiated the savings. Potential handover problems were reduced because the surgeon and anaesthetist remained responsible for the patient throughout their stay. And sick leave was significantly reduced in that ward uh, that nursed these patients. So the pilot expanded really to a project which now involves five specialties, 28 surgeons and 23 anaesthetists. Of course we measured quality, but the numbers here were not great enough to have a significant meaning. I, I think that 
the hips, maybe a few more, were returned to hospital in the pilot and the knees the other way around. So there wasn't really much in it. Patient satisfaction was measured and as one might expect, and generally that was very favourable, uh, there were complaints about the food and as one uh, man said to us uh, that the food was actually worse than what he had while he was in jail. So that was saying something for him. <laughs> The other thing was that we nursed the patients as cohorts on the wards. So the four patients that were done that day were nursed right the way through in the same four bedded room. This became a competitive uh, process in which if Mrs Smith was going home on three days, everybody else was going home as well. And I think, uh, although we can't uh, claim any marriages from this, I think uh, certainly there have been a number of social activities that have occurred as a result of this cohorting of the similar patients. This was all published in the Journal of Internal Medicine, Internal Medicine Journal, July last year, uh, with a number of authors, including a health economist and the appropriate statistician. Now, because of the success of the pilot, that is a significant increase in productivity increase in efficiency and in reduced costs, the Ministry therefore approved for us to build a new hospital, which was what we were asking for in the first place. And the Waitamata District Health Board in December last year approved that we should continue the process that we had started uh, within this new hospital. Now, sometimes during this process I felt like Brian because when we talk about this the response sometimes is not as agreeable as I'd thought so they say to Brian or John in my case thank you for your thoughtful and constructive proposal without further ado we'll now dive into malicious envy based criticism character assassination and petty bickering we have had quite a lot of of concerns about the pilot because it has involved quite a major change in the way senior medical staff are employed. And the concerns fall into five separate categories. The first is to criticise or argue or discuss the data and I think that's entirely reasonable and that must be done but we have done our best to ensure that that data is valid. The second is an ideological objection and this has come mainly from the senior doctors' union because we are changing again the way they are or have been employed. I can't argue against people's ideology but I do know that when a belief is in conflict with evidence then belief will win. So I've had a, I have had quite a job to convince some of my colleagues that what we're doing is correct. The third objection or concern relates to equity and there is no doubt uh, that uh, this has maybe uh, privileged some members of the hospital as others have not been able to take part in this program. The equity or inequity also occurs within departments. The anaesthetists who have been involved in this uh, pilot uh, have done much better out of it than those who have not been able to do that and there's some inequity between the surgeons and anaesthetists. We will do our best to address this and as from uh, two weeks ago, uh, the surgical fees have been reduced for each hip and knee and I think this might be the first time for a long time that actually uh, medical staff have actually had their, uh, their uh, remuneration reduced. The fourth problem relates to control because giving the surgeons and anaesthetists the ability to control their own workload to decide how it's going to be done means other people must lose control. And uh, this has come from, uh, certainly to a small extent, from, uh, from the management side. Uh, but I think overall, as I'll say in a moment, we've had huge support uh, for many quarters within the hospital. And the big question, of course, is that of teaching. How can you teach uh, junior doctors if they're actually not involved in these things. This, this I think is the most valid concern and we have addressed this because I think for the first time 
We have a hospital which is publicly funded. It provides a service for public patients. But it is not reliable on junior staff for service. And all too often we get confused, I think, in our minds of uh, uh, service with actual teaching. So we're going to use this as a model for teaching, particularly task-based teaching for surgeons within this new facility. And it, op it offers an opportunity to look at teaching in a different way in this environment. So in conclusion, we have proposed an alternative model for senior clinician employment, and this has been introduced for the provision of elective surgery, which promotes an increase in productivity, increases efficiency, reduces costs, and maintains quality. Now, I didn't tell you at the beginning, because that nice picture that I showed you at the start was actually a photograph taken from my house of an island in the middle of the Hauraki Gulf, which is the Auckland Harbour. The name of the island is called Rangi Todo, which means blood sky. And so at the end of the day, and this is at the end of the day for the same island, and this is now the same island but on a summer's evening. But at the end of the day, where we've had, with this project, a lot of support from the board, from the CEO, from senior management, from colleagues, from the nurses, from the Health Alliance, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do really is in this environment of reduced health funding to provide the best service to as many patients as we can. Thank you, Thank you John. Thank you. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I think a, a very challenging and fascinating presentation. John, thank you very much. I think it uh, gives, gives us all a lot of food for thought. Could I just check, first of all, Mark, uh, have we got any comments coming through on tweet or questions? Yeah, I think the main one is, could you talk more about how you reconcile the training concerns with the staff? Okay, so the, the training again? concerns. Uh, if you could say a bit more, John, about... I can't the, hear it, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm the, 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 a lot of people are tweeting about you know, the concerns of training you know, the junior doctors, bringing people into the, the new way of working. With regard to training, nothing is so good that it can't be improved. And I think that from the point of view of teaching surgic, young surgeons, that a lot of time is wasted by holding retractors and doing things which actually aren't that productive for them. So the aim here is that we will now be able to dedicate specific operating lists for those surgeons to learn specific tasks. So it will be a, a programmed teaching uh, uh, method in which we would aim to give those surgeons the, the appropriate book knowledge simulated teaching and then uh, follow that with the time in the operating room. At the end of that time, they would then get a certificate to say, well, they're now competent in those things. And it's, very, it's a very different concept from what we usually do, which is a time-based teaching concept, which you hope that if at the end of the time you've been with the surgeons, that you will actually come out and know what to do. So it's an opportunity for change. Any other points, that Mark? Yeah. Um, the financial incentives, how sustainable is it to have any statistics mopping the floors? Yeah. Um, how sustainable is it to have an ethotist mopping floors? I think is the question. <laughs> is that a one off, John? Or is it's what funny, I, I'm, yeah, sorry? What, what training is needed for mopping? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How well do they do it? Pardon? How well do they do it? On the mopping. <laughs> He's a good mopper. I think that I've had a lot of time in orthopaedic surgery and there is no doubt to me that 
Surgeons and anaesthetists will work harder if they were rewarded to do so. I mean, that's a terrible thing to say because we're all supposed to be altruistic and all the rest of it. But actually, if people are going to be remunerated for what they do, then they will tend to work harder. Now, this is okay as long as the overall total cost is less than the national price. But in fact, our aim and has been and will be in the new hospital to actually do the surgery for 80% of the national price. And that's what we have done today. I'll take a few questions from the floor. Uh, and could you introduce yourself, please? The first one here. We'll come to you shortly. And the, yes, we'll see. I'm Mike Bergström from Sweden. I, when I listen to you, I hear a lot about productivity. And I hear a lot about finance. And I want to know how you balance that with quality measures since the mission of healthcare is to reduce the burden of illness. So how about your balancing measures? Because it's not about only productivity, it's about efficiency, effectiveness. And then you need, and I haven't heard that, how you're balancing. I think uh, that the, already this morning there's been, with the keynote speaker, the comments Gentlemen, that uh, you yeah, can actually be more productive here. Yeah. with an increase in quality, and I think there's a lot of evidence that that is so. I think, yes, for me, that sometimes it is in conflict, but from the point of view of this project, we have maintained the quality. In fact, we've improved it. We have reduced costs, and we have improved efficiency because of the innovations that the surgeons and the anaesthetists themselves have made. Question here at the front. Oh, there's, there's one at the back. We'll come to you now in two seconds. Uh, thank you very much. My name is David Moores. I'm a family physician from Edmonton, Alberta. Could you comment on the impact on wait times? Because from a quality perspective, if I'm having to wait 11 months or 12 months for my shoulder operation and so on, or my knee or my hip, were you able to measure the impact on wait times? New Zealand has a, uh, a different uh, system uh, of ensuring the patients get their surgery within a certain period of time. So we don't have wait times anymore. And they are... Um, we are obliged to provide the surgery within a certain period of time. Now, if there are too many people that therefore want the surgery, then we in New Zealand have a prioritising system which ensures that the people that need that surgery most get it. But we are actually fined if our waiting time goes over a certain period. So. Part of the project, I mean, the, the aim here was that if we can put through the straightforward, less complex surgery more quickly, then that will help everybody by reducing the time for everybody. But the way we have things structured at home, not, I can't give you a reduction of that waiting time to that waiting time. A uh, question is just back here. Yes? Simon Varney, Manchester Royal Infirmary. Can you just explain briefly, in, but with a little bit of detail, how much and how, or how you remunerate the clinicians, that's the surgeon and the anaesthetist, and is it resulting in higher salaries for the period worked, the same or lower? Briefly, but in some detail. <laughs> the method of remuneration means that the surgeons and anaesthetists are receiving more than they would if they were on their standard salary. However, from the point of view of the anaesthetist in particular, the cost of the anaesthetic service in the pilot was actually less than the cost of the anaesthetic service within the main hospital. And that was because of all the add-ons that occur in the main hospital an anaesthetist to supervise other anaesthetists, the registrar cost, and other things that go 
which are probably not necessary for these patients. So yes, the surgeons and anaesthetists received more. They worked harder. But the overall cost for the anaesthetic side of things was less in the pilot than it was in the public. Back here, yep. um, Catherine Mandel from Australia. I've got the question in two parts. The first is, do your numbers include the costs of pathology and radiology and all of these seemingly peripheral things, and are you making them part of a panel or tailoring to the individual patient? And are the earlier discharges transferring the costs of care to the family so they're taking care or leave rather than keeping the costs within the hospital? I'm sorry, I missed, I missed some of that, but all the costs for radiology, laboratory, and all that are included in the cost that we've measured, if that was, that was the question. That was part of it, but are they also... So I've got laryngitis. Are, are those costs now a package for each patient? They get, all get the same tests? Or are you tailoring the tests for the individual patients so they only get what they actually need? Do you get that? So the, are, the, are, the, are the costs just sort of a set, a set budget, so to speak, for the patient? Is that what you mean? There's a, so a, a do every patient get exactly the same tests, yeah. or do you just do the tests the patients actually need based on individual assessment? Because presumably no, individual patients are going to cost different, but is it within a cost envelope? Or? Oh. Uh, some of the costs are through cost envelope structure, yes. That's a straight oh, yeah. answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I like it. Uh, one at the very back, and we'll come to this, and we'll, we'll have to wrap up now in a second because uh, Johnny Tetz is there to give his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yes, hello, I'm, I'm Bernie Welsh. I'm a GP from the north of Scotland. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the, um, the payment, I suppose, the extrinsic motivators for these doctors to come and, uh, to come and work with you. Um, in, in terms of thinking how generalizable this might be uh, to, to your system, was there anything about the, the sort of intrinsic drives or the intrinsic motivators to these surgeons, these anaesthetists, and nursing staff um, that uh, that was important to to, to bring them on board. What um, so just the money? You know, t tell me more about what what motivated them as people. What was in it for them, uh, uh, as well as pay? Are you asking me what motivates people? <laughs> was yeah, that? Yeah, was it just money? Yeah. Or is there something intrinsic? No, I think, I mean, I, I, for the, the two surgeons and the anaesthetists which started off with this, uh, they, they saw a need from the point of view of being able to put these fitter patients through more quickly. I think there was a fair degree of altruism in that. But I would say that we had had problems getting the surgeons and anaesthetists to work at a hospital 35 kilometres away. And that's why it actually had been used as a storeroom. The fact that there was no junior staff there meant that it was going to be more difficult for them and they were going to be on call for those three days the patients were in hospital. So the package of care, therefore, was structured to accommodate that. And yes, therefore, they got a greater payment for that. One final question. Uh, is it Emma Dalton, medical student, London. You made no reference in your presentation to the provision of critical care, either before or after these surgeries. Was there any facility for that on site? And if not, were you pre selecting patients to avoid the need for it, or how did you incorporate it, and what impact did it have on your um, financial underlying? This is a trainee who will go far, I think. Is she, is she asking the right questions at this stage? Well done. John? Okay. From the point of view of the pilot, they were match cohorts for the point of view of costing. However, uh, the provision for intensive care in these groups of patients uh, is in the region of three or four patients per year. That is for the new facility that we're going to build. Now, in New Zealand, the private hospital system 
themselves do not have uh, intensive care. So the tendency there is if there is an issue, those patients are transferred to the base hospital, and we would expect to do the same in this instance. The new hospital is actually 100 metres away from the main hospital, so that shouldn't be a great issue for them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to draw, uh, draw to a close there because we have another speaker, but I think you'll agree, a very challenging and, uh, uh, I think, first-class presentation. Can you give a round of applause to John, please?